So we talked about the fundamentals of neoliberalism, which is an economic model at its core. Essentially, that the free market can solve anything that ails a society, from trade policy to racism. Today, we're going to do a rapid-fire run-through of the history of neoliberalism, or at least the perverted doctrinal version of it that has run U.S. economic, social, and foreign policy for the past 50 years. UNFTR. So I'm suggesting that neoliberalism has been the U.S. model for 50 years, which puts our start date sometime in the 1970s. But since we're building this channel as a curriculum of sorts, let's review a few key dates and events that led to the neoliberal era. Recall that there were a couple of key events in the 1940s, starting with the release of Friedrich Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, in 1944. In the book, Hayek swam against the tide to proclaim that liberal economies were becoming too centralized through large-scale social programs that would ultimately lead to totalitarianism. Fine. The next important date involves Hayek as well, when he established a group called the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947 to gather like-minded thinkers that shared his worldview. This society would come to influence a generation of economists who would in turn influence policymakers around the globe in coming decades. Now remember that in the 1960s, Milton Friedman attached himself to the Goldwater campaign. Now by this time, Friedman had a formidable reputation in policy circles and he lent an air of credibility to Goldwater. Even though the campaign was unsuccessful, it was really the first time that an economic model blended with aspects of a purely political campaign. And many of the early political figures who would associate with Goldwater in those days would now be considered forefathers of the libertarian movement. The other notable event in the 1960s that animated the convergence of the economic and political doctrine was the publication of Unsafe at Any Speed by Ralph Nader in 1965. This was the height of Nader's powers as a consumer advocate and the beginning of the business community's call to arms to fight back against government regulation. We did a short primer on the importance of the 1970s, which is where we're going to rejoin the neoliberalism story. Side note, we're going to stop in the 1980s and cover the 90s another time when we dissect the legacy of Bill Clinton, because the 90s really were the high point of neoliberalism, and there's an argument that it has been in decline ever since that period and that we're now exiting the neoliberal era as we speak. So the rise and the crescendo is the most crucial time in the period to know, in my opinion. So let's go through some of the highlights. In 1970, Milton Friedman was appointed the chairman of the Mont Pelerin Society. In 1971, Lewis Powell Jr., a high-profile private attorney, penned a memo to the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that caught fire in business circles, and it galvanized a generation of business leaders to get politically active and stop taking crap from people like Ralph Nader. Powell would soon be rewarded by Nixon with a seat on the Supreme Court, despite never having been a judge. 1973 was a big year. There are three different events that coalesce to paint a fascinating picture. First off, from 1973 to 1974, the U.S. hit the first rough patch of stagflation, high unemployment and inflation, which gave an opening to the neoliberal economists to claim that it was the result of government spending and intervention, even though it had more to do with Nixon's currency shock and the oil crisis. Also in 1973, the Heritage Foundation was born. We tipped our cap to this terrible organization and we'll go into greater detail in the next video. Needless to say, this was a big one because they essentially activated the Powell Memo by turning it into a policy organization. And then there was 9-11. Not that 9-11, the original one. 9-11-1973 and the CIA supported assassination and overthrow of Salvador Allende's socialist government in Chile. Chicago School economists were dispatched to Chile to advise the U.S.-backed coup leader, Augusto Pinochet, on how to build a market economy. This would become standard operating procedure for the next several decades. Destabilize, overthrow, send in suits, and privatize. Open the markets for U.S. corporations to invest and access cheap labor and resources. And thus, the neocon movement successfully completed the merger with the neoliberal economists who turned a blind eye to the deadly aspects of force in service of opening the world economy. This was the moment neoliberalism ceased being strictly an economic theory and was weaponized by neocons and libertarians. Say it loud, say it with me, yo, yo Milton Friedman. Friedman. 
So when you hear people talk about neoliberalism over the past half century, they're really referring to the evil alchemy of billionaires and war hawks perverting the doctrinal economic elements from the Chicago School as cover for their plans for world domination. Moving on. 1974. Harvard philosopher Robert Nozick lends credibility to the burgeoning hardcore libertarian movement by publishing Anarchy, State, and Utopia to argue for something that he called the minimal state, in which the government is the only entity permitted to use force, but only to protect liberty and property and to provide policing. Now let's move into the go-go 80s. 1980. The Mercatus Center was founded at conservative George Mason University to provide another home to far-right political extremists, thus building out the bench of think tank wonks tasked with developing propaganda for the GOP and ultimately the right-wing media echo chamber. Having infiltrated political circles in academia, the neoliberal movement also moved into the legal profession in 1980 based on a 100-page thesis written by a man named Michael Horowitz. His goal was to end the trend of liberalism in the courts by developing a network of conservative students from the top law schools who would eventually take over the legal system. 1981, Reagan slashes taxes for the rich and corporations under the concept of trickle-down economics. Of course, not even a little bit of pee trickled out of the right-wing pee-pee onto the thigh of middle America. But the stock market never looked back as wealthy people and corporations poured money into equities to boost their gains. 1982. Michael Horowitz didn't have to wait long to see his thesis turned into action. This was the year the Federalist Society was founded, and it's been responsible for turning out gems like Antonin Scalia and hand-picking Amy Coney Barrett, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh. 1983. Ronald Reagan revises the social security system by increasing the tax but leaving in place the maximum income threshold. Then he kept tax cuts for the wealthy, which created a huge gap between the rich and the people who proportionally paid much less into the system. He also instituted a tax on social security benefits for senior citizens and passed legislation that took social security funds out of trust and into the federal government, which he then used to pay for military spending and general operations all of which was designed by Alan Greenspan, who would ultimately be rewarded with the Fed chair position in 1987. And so there you have it. Obviously, this is a fraction of the story, but I framed it this way for a couple of reasons. The first is to show you how a purely theoretical economic model was co-opted over time by dark forces in the billionaire class to tear down any structural impediments to building wealth to infect liberal institutions with their perverted doctrine and export their strategy to subservient nations for us to plunder. But it's also a fascinating roadmap to how to overthrow a system. Build your plan and find like-minded intellectuals that support you. Invite the ruling class to participate in fighting the masses. Fund think tanks that invent research that support your theories. Plant acolytes within liberal systems like academia and the legal profession. Wait for a crisis like stagflation. Blame the crisis on convenient factors that support your argument, whether right or wrong. Then present yourself as the answer to the problems you made. Here endeth the video.